A warm welcome to the 26th session in the second module of the course signals and systems. And we shall spend this entire session on recapitulating some of the ideas that we learnt in the last session and explaining them a little better. They were rather slightly difficult ideas. You see, the first idea was about that sin x by x. So, let us plot that sin x by x pattern. What we had was an x 0 given by omega 1 into t minus t 1. And we had plotted the pattern sin x by x or sin x 0 by x 0. But then it was also scaled. So, what we plotted was essentially 2 kappa 0 times omega 1 into sin x 0 by x 0 and x 0 was defined as shown here. Later what we said was we wanted to take omega omega 1 tending to infinity. So, we would like to plot this not as a function of x 0, but now we plot as a function of t minus t 1. So, let us do that. Let us plot this as a function of t minus t 1. So, the function of t minus t 1, the nulls depend on omega 1, of course. The first null is at pi by omega 1. This is now a function of t minus t 1. And the first negative null is at minus pi by omega 1. So, this width here is 2 pi by omega 1. And the height here at the point 0 is 2 kappa 0 times omega 1. So, as omega 1 tends to infinity, approximate by triangles, call this a triangle, call this a triangle, call this a triangle, call all of these triangles. So, you have a situation where you have several triangles, you could, I mean see this is an informal explanation, what I am saying is essentially whatever shape you choose, Asymptotically, what is happening is the height diverges to infinity and the width goes to 0. So, a non-zero but constant area starts, get starts getting encapsulated in each of these, the main lobe and the side lobes. And this is where you just have to take my word, if one really wants to do a precise calculation, one would have to use numerical integration or other kinds of methods. In fact, I encourage you to do that. Those who really want to understand this better might do well actually to do a numerical integration of these and find out how this area converges as you take omega 1 tending to infinity. If you look at this figure here, what is happening is we have several triangles here or several shapes. Essentially, asymptotically, we have a sum of constant area positive and negative. And the beauty is that areas are remaining constant asymptotically. You can visualize that as the height is growing to infinity in each case and the width tends to 0. In fact, if you look at it, I have reasoned out for the main lobe, but you could do a similar reasoning for the side lobes. You do not want to worry too much about the side lobes because you can slowly assume that it is the main lobe which will dominate anyway. None of the side lobes have an area, you know, if you take, there is one positive side lobe, there is another negative side lobe, there is another positive side lobe, there is a negative side lobe. So, the positives and negatives, if you look at it, the side lobe contribution, I mean at least here I am not evaluating it formally, but I am just stating that the side lobe contribution will never overtake the main lobe contribution in area. So, finally, it is the main lobe area which will dominate. So, to get an idea of what is happening, you could be quite content in just looking at the main lobe area to get a feel. So, the whole situation here is that we are reaching a situation where all the area starts getting concentrated around the center 0, t minus t 1 equal to 0. And we have the flexibility. So, here we have the flexibility to choose kappa 0. In fact, a choice kappa 0 equal to 1 by 2 pi makes this asymptotically an impulse delta t minus t 1 asymptotically as omega 1 tends to infinity. So, 
the question is where is the orthogonality issue here we need to understand that where does orthogonality come in now look carefully what we are integrating is this quantity and we can rewrite this quantity now when you write it like this it's obvious that we are talking about an inner product let's think of it as an inner product so let's look at the expression here this is an inner product in fact it is an inner product of e raised to the power j omega t and e raised to the power j omega t1 treating omega as a variable as the independent variable but you know you could as well write inner product of e raised to the power j omega 1 t and e raised to the power j omega 2 t treating t as the independent variable and that would essentially be integral from minus to plus infinity e raised to the power j omega 1 t times e raised to the power j omega 2 t complex conjugate dt and that's very easy to write that is essentially minus to plus infinity e raised to the power j omega 1 Minus omega two into t dt, which is essentially a very similar integral. Essentially, what we have shown is that kappa zero times this integral fits to delta omega one minus omega two. And here we have the answer to the question that we have been asking: Where is the orthogonality of these? rotating complex phases coming into the picture it's coming in here look at it you have essentially the inner product is an impulse now you know this inner product actually is a divergent quantity because the integrand has a magnitude of 1 but what it means is if you allow generalized functions that inner product goes to an impulse the impulse is at omega 1 minus omega 2 is equal to 0 the impulse can be thought of as a function of omega 1 minus omega 2 not omega so difference between the frequencies as the difference between the frequencies approaches 0 you have a non zero area concentrated and as omega 1 minus omega 2 goes away from 0 you have nothing there if you think of the impulse informally so the inner product is an impulse that's how we should understand this orthogonality it is all concentrated around omega 1 minus omega 2 equal to 0 to think of the impulse as a limiting case of a pulse the pulse dies down quickly very quickly except at the point where it lies so the inner product dies down very quickly when you go away from omega 1 minus omega 2 equal to 0 so in this reconstruction that is how we have indirectly brought in the orthogonality of the rotating complex exponentials with different angular frequencies we've spent three sessions on explaining this inverse this is slightly involved you would need to think of this again and again to understand and appreciate these ideas better we will also do some examples and exercises on the fourier transform and that would make it easier for you to appreciate how the fourier transform is used now if you really want to have a rigorous understanding of the fourier transform one should go down to functional analysis but what i've tried to do here from a fundamental course on signals and systems point of view is to give a somewhat rigorous and a somewhat informal in explanation of the fourier transform and its inverse we'll see more in the next session thank you